The subject matter for today is social media research with digital methods. My name is Richard Rogers, Professor of New Media and Digital Culture at the University of Amsterdam. What I would like to do today is talk about a number of uh, techniques to study social media platforms. Uh, and these techniques, broadly known as digital methods, uh, are tool-based, uh, but also research question-based. So this is these, um, the examples that I'll give you of the projects that I'm covering um, will give you a sense of the kinds of research questions that are typically posed in digital methods work, uh, as well as some of the techniques, uh, specific techniques uh, that are used, um, and some of the outcomes as well, so how productive these methods can be. And in order to situate what we're going to be talking about today, I would like to think of social media as being, or social media research these days, uh, is in a is in a context, a larger context of of internet history, and in particular, the context of of studying social media as a as a comment space, uh, as a space of uh, discussion, uh, as a space of of debate, as a space uh, mainly of um, leaving comments uh, in your posts or making different kinds of contributions, uh, whether they're uh, 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 authentic, uh, toxic, sincere, insincere. Uh, but generally speaking, to think of social media research as research about the conversations that we are ha having online. And I, I want to give you um, one of the early examples of using techniques to sort of map and study uh, the common space. And this is the political blogosphere. Uh, this is work that was done by Lada Adamic and uh, her colleague um, to map the uh, liberal and conservative uh, blogospheres in the US and look in particular at their linking patterns. So which blogs link to which other blogs. And, and you see here, a, a kind of classic story of polarization uh, where in the red you have conservative blogs largely linking to one another uh, in the blue the liberal blogs in the US context linking to one another and some shared linkages uh, but the story is about the lack of shared linkages uh, between them between the two spheres uh, and when you look to this work more deeply, you'll see that the conversations are quite different, the language is quite different, these, in some sense, realities are, are quite different. Now, um, I want to talk about the contemporary study of, of social media and, and the various techniques of studying uh, each of these uh, platforms. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Twitter, Facebook, um, Google web search, which people don't normally group in, in social media research, but nevertheless, uh, Instagram, YouTube, and then I'll get a little bit into the uh, deep vernacular web, so Reddit, 4chan, and some alternative uh, tech platforms, Telegram, and then the newcomer uh, TikTok. So I want to start off with, with Twitter and give you a couple of examples right off the start of, of pieces of work. So this one here um, is of the URLs that are in tweets by supporters of uh, then-candidate uh, Donald Trump uh, versus uh, Hillary Clinton in the run-up to the 2016 elections. And you see here the uh, again, a similar story to the one that we just showed with the political blogospheres, where you have the Hillary supporters in their tweets linking or referencing particular media sources and Trump supporters in their tweets referencing particular media sources and then very few shared sources are referenced. Now, if you look also a little bit more specifically at the sources, you see also on the Trump supporter side the referencing of some quite extreme sources um, versus on the Hillary side, which is a little bit more mainstream. So when you begin to, so not only is it a, a story about um, different referencing or perhaps uh, people use the term echo chamber, etc., 
but you can also drill into the, the types of sources um, being uh, referenced. The, the next one um, is a technique to segment an audience or map a sort of um, set of or kind of movement, if you will. This is the alt right, um, and these uh, are um, pictures of those who mention the core members of the alt right. And, and if uh, so, if you mention all eight of them, you're on the first map. All seven, all six, or 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 seven or six, or now five, and so you're you're beginning to show um, the sort of audience for the um, the the alt right. So here it is again. And so there's the core, and then who, who mentions all eight of them? And there you have it. And then who mentions uh, at least seven? And then who mentions at least six? And and so forth. So this is a that's a that's an audience uh, segmentation uh, technique that you can uh, you can undertake in order to sort of map and map it like an audience or a group formation or or even. Uh, an extent uh, um, social sort of a social movement um, so those are two examples um, so one is uh, studying the shared sources of, of um, supporters of particular uh, candidates political candidates the second one as I just mentioned the segmented audiences you can also um, look at into retweet networks so who retweets whom uh, this work is often done to look at for example, in, in political research, um, here it says parliamentarians. So, so because most parliamentarians uh, in the Western world all have Twitter accounts, and then you can begin to study um, their their own networks uh, and and their I, who who they retweet and who they don't retweet, and you can then look at diversity, plurality, or or again group formation. Um, you can also study hashtag publics. Uh, the, the approach that I oftentimes put forward is to study competing ones, competing hashtags, and thereby potentially antagonistic uh, hashtag publics. So um, Black Lives Matter versus Blue Lives Matter, uh, etc. Just a couple of other ones I'll mention briefly. Um, there, single hashtag analysis has often been uh, disparaged in the literature. However, um, since Me Too, I think it's been making a comeback, um, but but arguably um, it's one of the areas where it would work quite well is for uh, summits. So summits normally have political summits or other kinds of or Olympics, or they normally have a, a kind of dominant hashtag. Which, if one were to query and make a tweet collection about that hashtag, one could explore um, that summit. Um, the tweet collections of public figures, tweet collections of uh, political leaders, uh, populist leaders, are all uh, politicians in a particular uh, election or, or other kinds of public figures. Um, oftentimes these days in particular there's a lot of work being done on artificial amplification, uh, the extent to which there are bots in a particular space so if you were to make a tweet collection about a, a summit or about an election, uh, you could measure the bot activity and see the extent to which this bot activity is artificially amplifying one side versus another. Um, and then, of course, most recently, there's been quite a lot of work on uh, disinformation studies, uh, so-called fake news. Uh, and this has been facilitated, in particular, in Twitter research by the availability or Twitter's making available particular data sets. So the, the, the two well-known ones are those of the so-called Russian trolls and, and, and who they think also is a set of Iranian uh, trolls. And they made this, this, uh, this, these data sets available that you can explore. Uh, what's interesting about them is the kind of privacy policy that's built into them and the, and the, the ethics thereof. So Twitter um, has uh, the idea that if uh, of a very specific definition of a public figure, and that is if you have 5,000 or more followers, uh, you're considered as such by Twitter. So in their data sets, 
they hash or anonymize all users under under uh, that figure of uh, followers and those above uh, they don't hash uh, so that's uh, interesting to point out okay I'd like to now um, move over to Facebook uh, Facebook is the largest of these uh, platforms it's also in some ways the most significant uh, in this in the sense of what we've been talking about for for these sorts of you know, for the disinformation studies etc uh, also have had the reputation recently of um, being this the the site of quite a lot of problems around uh, elections in particular and and this is a piece of work here that I think is kind of interesting to, to point out. It's, it uh, was in the Wall Street Journal and it actually ran for quite a while. They simulated uh, what they called red feeds and blue field feeds. Uh, so if you were uh, a conservative uh, or like, a, like let's say a Trump supporter versus in the previous election a Hillary supporter or in the more recent election a, a Biden supporter, uh, the kinds of sources that you likely would encounter in your feed, uh, and um, and then there and then the, and then the sort of uh, the kinds of narratives uh, about social issues or about the other uh, that you would um, that you would be coming across more regularly, uh, and th and then comparing these um, is uh, is the is the task at hand. So there's the there's the simulation. Um, another technique is something we call most engaged with content analysis, uh, and this is a technique where you figure out which posts on Facebook uh, have received the most engagement. And um, so engagement is likes, shares, comments, or now reactions, shares, comments, and then you add those up and and. Uh, you see, for example, you take a set of pages of a particular uh, group or group formation. You see here in this example, it's the alt-light, which is the sort of less extremist um, alternative right, uh, that sort of movement. And uh, we took a number of their pages on Facebook, and we looked over a per particular period of time. Uh, in this case, I think it was a year. Uh, and then looked at which posts received the most engagement across all of these pages. So in some sense, you're 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 kind of demarcating a particular uh, group or group formation, and then within that, over a period of time, what animates them. Oh, I should just also mention uh, before moving on that that the visualization here is a tree map. So the 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 uh, post with the greatest uh, amount of engagement uh, is is uh, ha is resized. So that is the largest size. And we also um, placed in this graphic also a sort of subcategorization of different types of posts. So the subcategorization was whether the posts were about white supremacy, whether the posts were about. Uh, um, counter jihadism or Islamophobia, etc. And we in fact found that it was that it was the anti-Muslim posts that animated this 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 group the most. Oh, it should also be pointed out that um, this work uh, does not explicitly take into account, or can even perhaps take into account, uh, cont the effects of content moderation. So it could be um, that uh, posts about you know white ethno nationalism were the most uh, engaged with but that they have been subsequently removed so the 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 next one is um, a network graph a network visualization and here um, it's a visualization of uh, pages that link to one another so on Facebook pages can link to other pages uh, they, they can also um, uh, have, be, have related pages, so you could in, in fact make a, a network on the basis of uh, Facebook's recommendation uh, algorithm or make a, a network on the basis of uh, which page links to which page. And this again um, is the alt-right, we were doing a lot of work on this at the time, 
and you and you see that you can um, link, have a look at the interlinked uh, page uh, network, and then by cluster label them, and then see certain subcultures, subcultural movements or sub movements uh, within a, a larger uh, a larger space. So so you see um, the the alt right uh, with a, a bunch of um, uh, sort of subcultures like like uh, vaporwave or uh, others white pride etc. So for Facebook, um, generally uh, what you see are uh, first the, the simulations that I showed you. So these are these are um, simulations of um, of news feeds according to let's say ideology. The second one is that I showed was the most engaged with content analysis. So you take a take a, a list of pages, uh, choose a time frame, and then look across all pages, all posts on all pages to see which ones were engaged with the most, uh, and then that answers the question of what animates a particular group. You can also do inter-liked page analysis. Um, now, the, 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 the most engaged with content analysis you can do these days uh, still with FacePager, which connects still to the Facebook uh, Pages API, which for most tools and for many people was discontinued, but that one still continues. Or you can do this work uh, manually. Um, so, yeah, so the same goes for interlinked page analysis. Now, Facebook has rolled out after basically deprecating the Pages API, it rolled out its own tool originally built for marketeers, uh, CrowdTangle. There's also a marketing tool called BuzzSumo that you could repurpose to do most engaged with content analysis. But this type of content analysis or, or engagement analysis, let's say, uh, is um, for web URLs on Facebook. So how well do particular web URLs do? Uh, so rather than Facebook posts, and that's that's very very different, but also uh, could be interesting. And finally, Facebook does have a an API, a political ads um, uh, archive API, which one can uh, also look at and do some work with. Um, there are also other projects to uh, archive Facebook. Um, uh, the, the one in particular that I'm referencing here is a counter archiving project, but the, there are a few others where one collects a, a set of uh, pages on a particular uh, topic, like like Russian disinformation pages, um, which are likely to be taken down, uh, and then one can um, you know have that archive keep you know so so this is also a, a particular way of of trying to do re Facebook research in the times of what's referred to as platform lockdown. So the deprecating of uh, platform APIs or other, other ways in which uh, Facebook in particular, but also Instagram and others are making it more difficult for researchers to get, uh, to get research data. Okay, I would like to move now to Google Web Search um, and in particular, uh, talk about a few ways of looking into sort of let's call them hierarchies of credibility. Um, this, it's a web epistemological concern. So, you know, which sources of information have the privilege of providing users uh, with it? So, with, with information. So, which sources uh, rise to the top and which ones uh, don't uh, for particular queries? That's one, and another one is is has been in of, in, of interest recently is about so-called political bias of um, of big tech or of Silicon Valley tech, and and that's what this particular project uh, looks into here. Uh, this is a, a project where one queries Google, and when you query Google, you have to think about um, personalization. So for this, we use a research browser, uh, and we also um, uh, use uh, ch choose the region setting. So this was a project that was about the U.S. So we choose region U.S. and also used a, a U.S. VPN. So this is, and we we logged out, etc. So this is all ways in which to kind of disentangle ourselves from the 
on the object of study, so, so personalization, and especially geographical personalization, uh, doesn't affect the results. And so this is the, the results for queries, three queries, um, guns, firearms, is one query. The other one is Second Amendment, uh, and the third one is gun control. And so here you're looking at, you're looking to see what kind of sources are returned for a quote-unquote sort of neutral or neutral-ish uh, query uh, versus a conservative query and a liberal in the U.S. sense query. And, uh, and what we found quite remarkably is for all queries, the top three, four results were in themselves quite neutral. Uh, and so there were you know, Wikipedia, uh, things like this. Uh, and then after that, you had in the returns what you could call sort of left of center or liberal, sort of like from, from news organizations to, to NGOs, and then the, the quite specifically conservative either news sources or, or other types of sources, uh, conservative ones, um, were encountered at about result 35. So this is quite... Uh, yeah, it's kind of, kind of quite radical findings, or maybe not so, um, but it would be, I think, to publish them um, as I think they would be of great interest uh, to a particular side of that, that debate uh, these days. The second one that I wanted to talk about is what we refer to as, um, again, source distance. So how far from the top are particular uh, sources for certain queries and what you see here is a visualization of uh, what we were studying at the time was problematic information uh, in particular uh, election related issue spaces online so if you uh, queried for certain politicians names and social issues uh, where uh, in the results were if, if anywhere uh, were so-called problematic sources, and, and this these could be um, anywhere from sort of extreme um, sources uh, to conspiracy ones or imposter news organizations, etc. And so you see the, in, the, in the visualization uh, in red is where problematic sources were encountered for particular uh, queries, uh, and so uh, for. Uh, one or two queries, you can see there was quite a lot, and and so the, and you can you also get into here like the, the the politics of problematic information because it was you know it's in this particular example it's, it's a, associated in particular with um, populist leaders and populist parties. Um, so for Google web search, uh, more generally. Um, the the techniques that I was uh, referring to uh, concern.